All right, everyone. Uh, good evening. Brian Russell here, League Director. Welcome to our Salisbury Scramble Town Hall. Uh, our theme for Salisbury Scramble is adventure is out there. And I think probably the adventure we're all going to have this weekend is uh, how to make it fun for over 560 student athletes, which is uh, one of the highest numbers we've had in a while in this league. So uh, whether you were at Browns Creek with us uh, a week and a half ago and had a great time or you're brand new, first first event uh, this season for you, uh, I think the focus of this town hall is to talk about what makes Salisbury different uh, than Browns Creek and let everyone know uh, what to expect when they get out there. And that's kind of how we're going to structure uh, this meeting. Me, along with several members of the league staff, will spend maybe 30 to 40 minutes uh, walking through three main areas. Uh, we'll talk first about arrival, what to expect when you get there, parking and camping and pit zone and all those type of things. Uh, we'll tell you uh, and show you what Salisbury looks like. Uh, second part, we'll walk through the schedule. We'll go through Saturday, uh, all the things we have planned uh, on Saturday. And then third part, we'll spend some time on Sunday and uh, show you what the race schedule looks like. Uh, all throughout that, uh, feel free to drop your questions uh, into the chat window. Shell Frost, our programs director, will help moderate uh, the chat window. Uh, she will either get that question answered or after those three main uh, areas, we'll pause and just take those questions and make sure uh, they are getting answered. Um, as is tradition here in North Carolina for our town halls, at this point, I will announce the first student athlete to ask a question. Uh, we'll get a prize from our league sponsor, Fidlock. Fidlock makes some pretty unique design, uh, water bottles, cages with a magnetic lock to make sure you are prepared for your adventure. Uh, out there on the trail and they're offering a $50 uh, gift card to their online website. So first student athlete with a question tonight uh, at this point, uh, we'll get that $50 prize from Fidlock and looking forward to seeing what those questions are. We are here for the student athletes. So that's why I emphasize getting their questions uh, on the table. Uh, let me share my screen. And like I usually do on these town halls, uh, I want to walk you through basically where to find the information you're looking for. Uh, for the event. And so if you go to our website, this is the main page here, scroll up to the what's happening tab, come down here to the event schedule, and then scroll down to Salisbury Scramble. And I think this is the one place you want to go if you're looking for information uh, about what we're doing. I'll click on the event flyer in a minute. That is kind of the key document uh, for us, but I'll point out a couple other things as we go along. We might come back to these uh, throughout the meeting. Uh, don't need to spend a lot of time talking about the race course because thanks to Ben Harbor, who went out and recorded his ride on the race course, and Sean Moore, who spliced the video together, you can literally watch the video before you get out there and then look at Ride with GPS and see what this course is all about. Uh, we'll hear from Diane tonight about volunteers. We still have some slots open. You can click right there, sign on up. Uh, Michael Lashley will talk to us about camping. I think we have maybe a few spots uh, open for Salisbury camping. Uh, much like we did at uh, Browns Creek, we will have live results during the race on Sunday. You can click this button and it will bring you to that page uh, so you can see them. And just this morning, uh, I, I listed the call-ups um, for the event. And those are available. You can look there, see what your position is. And we'll talk about that uh, when we get to Sunday. Um, let's click on the event flyer and look at that uh, real quick. Uh, yesterday, I updated the schedule, the main schedule you're looking at on this first page and the race schedule. And I, I don't anticipate this will change at this point going forward. So this two pager is pretty safe to print by Friday. Um, I will talk about weather at the end of the meeting. A little bit of wet, it looks like. I think we'll be okay. If we have to make changes to the schedule, we will announce that through TeamSnap. And this is a live document. And this will always be the schedule for our event. If you go to the website and click on the flyer, uh, that will be the schedule. Uh, for the weekend. And a couple QR codes there just to make it easy for you to volunteer those uh, live results. And then at the end, economic impact uh, survey uh, to, to do, tell us how, uh, how we're doing. I actually had a meeting with uh, folks at Person County Parks and Recs, and I dropped some economic data on them about hosting one of our events, and it it, it opened their eyes uh, to what we can do. So thank you for, for filling those things out. Uh, let me go to, you can uh, get to the map, the venue map on the website, or you can click this link right here uh, and it will take you to. And let me just talk, uh, I'll start with the arrival and just the difference between Browns Creek and Salisbury is space. Browns Creek is huge, Salisbury is not. And so we'll be a little more restricted. So we have to be uh, open communication. I call it heads on a swivel, looking around all the time, uh, just making sure 
when we're in there in a very tight venue, uh, we're being safe about it and uh, certainly being respectful of everyone. Let me start with one key point on the way in. Uh, this little icon right here is a bridge that's under construction. So you are not able to get to Salisbury Park coming in from Statesville, uh, Statesville Boulevard down Hurley School Road. You will have to come in from the south down here, and we've marked that in red right here. So Cheryl's Ford Road up from the south is the, the entrance into uh, Salisbury Community Park for this weekend. When you come up and take that right into Hold Salisbury on. Community Park, you're going to come down this road. And you'll probably see five miles an hour signs out there. And I think someone has an open mic. If you can close it. Thank you. Uh, and you write about this intersection here. You will meet our parking coordinator, Sam, and his awesome parking attendants. And thank you for all the parking attendants uh, that are showing up. That's actually the welcoming committee here. And this is the first point everyone really needs to pay attention because Sam will direct you one way or the other into the parking area if you're there to park and you know come on down into the infield or start lining you up Saturday morning uh, to come into pit zone, which I'll let Ben Harbor talk about in a minute. I just wanna say, when you look in this area in purple, that's about 500 spaces right there. Carpool, carpool, carpool is the order of the day for our 560 athletes. And we do have a little bit of overflow parking in some grass areas and up here at Hurley Elementary School. But this venue is pretty tight. Uh, so everyone carpool as much as you can. Uh, so that's just some basic information about arrival. Uh, camping is open uh, Friday afternoon, 4 p.m., and we do have camping on site. So right now I'd like to turn over to Michael Lashley to give everyone an overview of what to expect if you're camping on site. Michael, you ready to give us an overview? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Hey, everyone. Um, so... Like Brian was saying earlier, Salisbury is different than Browns Creek. Matter of fact, from a camping standpoint, every venue we have is different. And I want to touch on that for just one quick second. Um, I've been getting a lot of emails and, and questions about opening up additional camping at different venues. Uh, the venue dictate, dictates the camping. A good example is at Browns Creek. Um, our tent camping there is very limited. Even though they've got a lot of athletic fields that aren't being used, they just didn't open that up to us. So um, when we when we go to a, a location, we ask for camping, we ask for different things, and um, and we kind of get what we get sometimes. So um, for future reference, Mayadan, really, really good camping, really good tent camping, both races. Um, Charlotte should be pretty good. Um, Fletcher still being kind of ironed out. There won't be our RV camping at Fletcher. There will be tent camping. Most likely be tent camping. In mind, so, um, just keep that in mind for future races. Um, so to Salisbury, uh, Brian, if you would zoom in just a little bit. Thank you. Um, RV camping is down towards the bottom of the screen for Brian's pointing now. Um, the one thing to keep in mind to keep in mind there is that um, we're asking some of the campers if they can back their their RVs and travel trailers up onto the curb. Um, that'll open up that area so we can fit everyone in there. Um, tent camping will be towards the, yep, in that area where Brian's pointing now or just north of there. Good tent camping availability. Um, one thing that Salisbury is very clear about, and they request that we don't have campfires there. So uh, I know that's a, a bummer for a lot of us, but that is, again, one of the, the, the things that Salisbury requires. So no solo stove, nothing like that. You can do grills. If you do a grill, we ask that you do those in the asphalt or hard surface park area and not on their on their athletic fields. Um, I think that's about it. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And again, if you've got questions, throw them in the chat. We'll pause here in a few minutes after we get through the arrival section, make sure we've we've covered those. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, turn over to Ben Harbor, our operations manager, uh, to walk everyone through really pit zone uh, setup and a, a tour around the infield when you uh, folks get there. Ben, are you ready to give us an overview? Absolutely. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Sweet. <clears throat> so as you come in, Brian said our first point of contact is going to be Sam and parking. Um, the question he's going to ask everybody, are you general parking? If so, you go to the right. Or are you pit zone dropping of equipment? If so, you'll go straight down that parking lot gravel there and then hang a left at the very bottom 
to follow the gravel road down towards our pit zone headquarters of all race functions. Uh, pit zone will open per the race flyer on our website. So please go to the website, what's happening to the events, and then down to Salisbury Scramble. Uh, you'll find the race flyer there, and I'll show you the times that pit zone is opening and pit zone is closing. Uh, per our race flyer, it will open at 10 a.m. right there where his lovely hand is. There will be some course crossing guards opening and closing those gates during the weekend on Saturdays and on our Sunday. Um, that is for safety of traffic going in and out. So please respect them if they ask you to hold up or to move to the side. Uh, we are trying to manage traffic in and out. Pit zone will open at 10 a.m. You will come in. Uh, we will have pit zone attendants to help you volunteers to get you to your location. And we are going to do our best to give you a little bit of space in our tightly packed pit zone to be able to unload your vehicle, a.k.a. dropping your equipment off to the edge a little bit or having a runner running the equipment to your pit zone and getting the vehicle back out. Uh, we are extremely tight there with space. We cannot have vehicles parked and chilling and cooling off. Almost leave them, run them, leaving them running so you can unload and leave. Pit zone will close at 1245. All vehicles need to be out so that we can have a safe course as we close it and open it up for the course for course inspection. If you have team trailers, they will not be permitted in pit zone for leaving. You can unload them quickly, and then you can take them back to the parking lot. Um, due to space, we're going to ask you to try to do your best to pull your trailer up in, back it into a space and up into the grass to allow for space. Um, Salisbury is extremely tight, extremely tight. So that is our pit zone. Um, it will be closed on Sunday. Uh, we will not have access to get into in and out of pit zone until after racing is completed. We do not have on the Sunday schedule a dedicated pit zone opening because of the compressed schedules and a few things changing. We will make a PA announcement of when pit zone will open. So we will pause there. Ask Brian if that's what you needed, and we'll continue up. That that is what we needed. I would just ask teams to really uh, have a good pit zone offload plan for Saturday, uh, two hours forty five minutes, and we've got fifty two teams. Uh, that can be a lot of cars. So try and condense as much as you can. But thanks for the overview uh, mm -hmm. of that, Ben. One one more item in, in our arrival uh, time here. Most everyone's familiar with you know finding the league trailer. Uh, registration, Heike and Kurt Biller will be there. Uh, reminder that new this season, every athlete that's registered needs their uh, wristband, their Salisbury Scramble wristband. You can pick those up at registration 10 o'clock. And then right next door to registration, our volunteer coordinators, Diane LeBlanc and uh, Jenny Wood. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers coming Friday. Thank you early Saturday morning, but certainly for the rest of the day, Saturday on Sunday, come find Diane and Jenny. And uh, Diane, can you give us an overview of uh, how volunteers are looking um, for the weekend and what they can expect when they show up? Uh, Brian, she's unavailable at the moment. I'll see if I can grab her. Okay. Uh, do we have uh, Jenny on the line that wants to cover that? Or I can just... Yeah, I'm here, Brian. Yeah, go for it, Jenny. Thanks. Uh, We're actually sitting at about 80% right now coverage. Um, we still have a few key positions that we need to get filled. We have a few course marshal positions. Um, we have some team trail core positions that we need to get filled for Saturday as well. Um, like, like you said in the link earlier, please go in and sign up. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to answer them or get you signed up for a slot. All right. Thank you very much, Jenny. And uh, let's pause here. Uh, Shell, are there any unanswered questions? Do we have our first student athlete question? Is there anything we need to cover here about arrival for anybody? 
Yes, our first student athlete question was from Stone from Cabarrus County, wondering what is different about the start and finish and what that looks like. Um, there were several other student athletes who asked that as well. Okay, so Stone from Cabarrus County is our first student athlete question asker. Shell, is that right? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, uh, Stone, if you can get us your email address so we can follow up with you. Uh, that'd be great. And uh, Todd Lester, race director or Ben Harbor Operations, uh, do you want to answer the start and finish question? Because it's the first thing we do on Friday when we show up is figure out where those are going to be. And I'll go back to the map. Uh, yep. sure. I'll be glad to take it if you like. Sure. Um, so the finish is the easy answer. It is going to be pretty much the exact same uh, location and line, uh, just like we had in 2022. Uh, so you come across the dam, you do that little gravel down and sweep and head back to your left and sprint up the edge of that hill against the greenway all the way to the finish. Uh, so that's going to be pretty much identical to our last visit to Salisbury Community Park. The start line is going to be pretty much the same, except for we've tried to lengthen it as best we can. Uh, last year, we started at one of the water bars. Um, thinking that we had enough hill incline. Uh, we did not. So this year we are going farther down on the field to try to make it a longer start into the woods single track. Uh, we are still just shy of a third of a mile, not even a third of a mile uphill. So it's not the distance uh, NICA recommends for an uphill start before single track. But it is straight. Uh, we will have just maybe a slight curve as we go into the woods um, as we meander around the food trucks. So if you find your favorite food truck, you can certainly ask for a food hand up if, if allowed and legal. They might try that on a start line. All right, Ben, thank you very much. And Stone, uh, thanks for the question. Absolutely why we're here to make sure you know what you're getting into uh, for the weekend. And before I go back to the schedule uh, and we're, you know, Probably right now, about 11, 30, 12 o'clock on Saturday, folks are getting pit zone set up and getting settled in. One of the first things we do is programs. We open the programs areas around 12 o'clock. Uh, right now, we believe that will be down here on Saturday, and this area will magically turn into staging on Sunday. Uh, but we think programs will be down in the lower area of the infield here. Uh, and since one of our very first programs activities is actually grit pre-ride checking around 1145, let's go to grit next and talk about what, uh, the girls can expect, uh, for Saturday. And I've got, uh, do we have Sharon on the line for grit review? We actually have Angie Tabor. Angie Tabor. Take it over. <clears throat> hey, Brian. Hey, all. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So grit on Saturday, what we have in the programs area, we have our pre-ride. Uh, which registration is required in pit zone to do the pre-ride. Um, and Brian's gone to, if you go to the flyer and you pick grit in the programs area of the flyer, this is what he's got up on the screen. Um, but again, we've got the pre-ride. Uh, you'll need to come and check in for that. We have a health and wellness chat with Marilyn Laxon. Um, and that'll be kind of while we're getting everybody gathered and ready for the pre-ride. Um, when we get back from that, we'll have the flat tire clinic. Um, that'll be from 1.30 to about 2.15. Um, we also have set up at the Gret tent. Um, one of our senior ambassadors has a word art project and female student athletes can come and contribute to that word art anytime between one and five. Um, and we have mentor program activities and those are for you know the mentors and the mentees you'll want to bring your adventure passport bring your bike um for that activity it's going to be all about you know learn something new about your bike that's what we're there for we want to give the girls a safe space and a chance to learn more and ask questions about their bike um and then of course there's just kind of fun activities going on at the grit tent the girls are getting together they're they're chatting, they're meeting new friends, they're um, seeing old friends and um, just doing some games and some they'll have the couches and things like that. So um, come out and join us at the Grit Tent. Angie, sounds like a great time. Thanks for giving everyone the overview. Uh, the Grit hoodie is looking awesome. Nice, uh, nicely done with that. Fantastic. And uh, also around noon, our adventure uh, area opens. And I think we're going to Bill Berry next. 
to getting over you what adventure has in store for this weekend. Bill, you ready? Thanks, Brian. So, uh, yeah, we're excited uh, also to open up uh, the adventure uh, tent area in the programs. Uh, and it was great to see at uh, Browns Creek how that was a real hub of activity on Saturday. So we're hoping for the same. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, skills area. Uh, uh, there you saw, uh, you may have seen some of the new features uh, that we can create an obstacle course out of uh, for our student athletes uh, and some of the, the, the um, uh, items like the Ninja Garage Bunnies to allow you to work on your bunny hop and uh, manual skills. Uh, and we'll be doing games uh, throughout the afternoon, uh, both on the bike uh, and off the bike. Uh, so if you want to have a cornhole tournament amongst your student athlete friends, uh, you can have fun doing that. Uh, the key item uh, in terms of the adventure passport, uh, just like uh, with Grit, we're very excited to be partnering with uh, Black Ox and Skinny Wheels to be able to do a fix your flat clinic. Uh, uh, that is a passport activity. Uh, and we'll also be utilizing them to also give a, uh, a clinic on a tubeless tire setup. Uh, so come and check that out. Uh, and just to, to reiterate, definitely to our student athletes, bring your uh, adventure passports uh, so you can have an activity checked off and you can have your activities you've already done stamped. Uh, we're excited. We're going to be hosting. Uh, we do a raffle uh, throughout the afternoon. So anyone who has an, a, uh, an activity checked off gets entered into a raffle. Uh, where we'll be able to, to raffle off some cool prizes from Fidlock uh, at the end of the afternoon at 4.30. Uh, so we're excited about all these activities. Um, so that's it. Thanks, Brian. Bill, good overview. Hub of activity, I think exactly right, <laughs> based on what we saw at uh, Browns Creek. So uh, kids having fun, that's what we're all about. So uh, awesome stuff. Uh, let's go next to uh, Leonard Van Hoos, our Team Trail Corps Coordinator, uh, new uh, for Salisbury, new for our season, new for our events, actually going to do some trail work uh, at this one. So Leonard, what uh, what do we have in store for uh, Saturday afternoon? Yeah, that's correct. We're actually going to do some maintenance on the Greenbrier Trail. We've got about seven projects out there. Uh, we're going to meet at 1245 and make our way down there carrying our tools. And the second one's at 345. We will be bringing the volleyball back this time, the bucket game, and the rock crawler. To drive the rock crawler, you need to have activities 22 and 25 done in your passport and bring your passport with you. And I think that's about it, Brian. All right. Uh, thanks uh, for your leadership, Leonard, in this area specifically. I know you had a, your team out there, and I think Cabarrus County was out last weekend actually working on the race course, which is pretty cool. We've done that twice now. Come work Browns Creek, race it. Come work Salisbury, race it. And that's just, that's pretty cool. I, I really like that. So I think uh, kids are going to have a great time. Uh, I did bring the map up. Let me do that real quick for everyone to give another orientation. When Leonard says check in programs area, and then marching up the hill through that crossing point out to this section here is the Greenbrier Trail. Uh, so everyone's aware of uh, where everyone's going to be working on uh, Saturday. Uh, so that's uh, programs for Saturday, largely, although we have a special one towards the end of the day. Uh, but let's go now to uh, Sean Moore, our director of uh, coach and team development, to walk through uh, coach brief and course inspection for the coaches and then the course inspection for the day. Sean, you ready to give everyone an overview? Yes. So uh, that coaches meeting course preview is going to be uh, Saturday morning, 1130 a.m. Uh, that will be at the league trailer. And the goal for that is going to be to kind of give you uh, any information that we have on the course and then come prepared to ride. And we will divide into our course preview ride groups and leave from there to get you facilitated on the trail and off the trail so that you can get back to your teams as quickly as possible. And for those of you that are going to be doing the grit free ride, if you will self-select into one of the first two groups that leaves, that will allow you to get back in plenty of time to go out on that grit free ride. Then for the student athlete course preview that you're going to do under red and yellow flags, so red flag being single lap, yellow flag being multi-lap student athletes. A couple of guidance uh, particulars that I want to talk over with you uh, for coaches out there. 
we need you to divide your groups. Some teams are very large. And so a mass of 40 kids is not meeting ratio. And it doesn't matter how many coaches you throw in there. It's a big plug kind of going down the trail. What we want you to do is these should be in the normal ride groups like you would normally practice with uh, of normal student athlete to coach ratios, one to six or two to eight, preferably two to eight. And do them by ability. So your faster, fitter kids in, in the first group, you need to subdivide into multiple groups to sort of put like with like. And then send one of your groups out and let another team send their group out. Like don't send all of your groups out together because then you're just going to become a de facto huge group again. So do some mixing so that you're allowing other teams with their faster student athletes to go out. And hopefully that will facilitate smoother traffic during the red and yellow flag sections. If you have a single lap student athlete who can't make it for the red, don't take them out in the yellow. Then what you need to do is take them out during the green because that is buddy led, that sort of thing. But yellow is specific to teams and teams with their multi-lap riders. So please respect who goes in what team and what time, and that way we can kind of get everybody moving a little bit more fluidly. Because I know on the multi-lap uh, course inspection last time at Browns Creek, it was a lot of stopping and starting. And it was a lot of large teams that were sort of in the front that were sort of start leading that kind of starting and stopping. It's natural for a large group. That's why we don't want groups that are larger than 10 functioning as one group. So that is the call for red and yellow and then green as always is going to be any student athletes using the buddy system to go out and do their own uh kind of pace ride think about red and yellow you're just taking those student athletes out for one lap and then green is where they can go out and ride it multiple times and then at 5 15 so 5 15 is the cutoff for student athletes heading out on their last lap before course closure so they need to start their last lap before 5.15. And at 5.15, coaches should gather at the start line. And at 5.30, coaches, we will leave and we will sweep. Not at 5.15. Uh, I think there was a little bit of miscommunication last time. We start gathering at 5.15. At 5.30, we will leave as a group and we will ride and sweep the course from there. So that's what it will look like on Saturday. All right. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, throw your questions in the chat if you have them. We'll pause here in a minute after our last uh, activity on Saturday. And that's another one of those differences from Browns Creek and uh, a little bit new for us uh, this season. That's movie night. Uh, adventures out there movie night. Shell, can you give everyone a preview of those coming to watch the movie, what they can expect? Sure. So um, from seven o'clock to nine o'clock, we're going to have a movie night. We're watching Disney Pixar's Up. Um when you arrive, student athletes need to be checked in by an adult, um, preferably if it's going to be a different adult picking them up and checking them out, just let us know so we know um, we're not handing your student athlete off to a stranger. Um, you'll be checking in with Jenny Wood. Uh, she'll be positioned um, up where you enter near the first course crossing, um, so there won't be cars going in and out of that pit area at all where we have student athletes walking in the dark. Um, they're going to be coming down to where the programs area was set up during the day. Um, we will have some movie trivia. Um, we'll have some snacks. Uh, and the team that raised the most money during the first week of our Trek fundraiser um, was the North Wake Trailhawks earned a blacklight movie night. So they will have a special VIP section with black lights, lots of glow sticks. Um, some extra movie candy and some pizza. Um, just a heads up, we're not looking to fill your student athletes up on pizza and junk food. Um, so I would suggest that you still have them eat a light dinner. Um, we're trying to be pretty conservative with the junk food um, the night before a race. So we'll have a little bit to make it fun, but it's not going to be a significant amount. Um, and then nine o'clock will be checkout time back at the same place where Jenny was. Um, you'll be checking out your student athletes there. Okay, thanks uh, for the overview. Looking forward to uh, movie night for sure. And let's uh, pause there, see if there's any major outstanding questions about Saturday uh, before we move over to Sunday. 
We have a few course related questions. Um, Noah Droke wondered how long the course is. All right. Who wants to take the the course question for Noah Droke? Well, Noah, you can go to the YouTube channel and look at the course preview, and linked on there is the GPX map of it, which will show you elevation, length, all those sorts of things. If you want to take a look at that. And I just uh, clicked on the website, either button. This is the Ride with GPS link, uh, Noah, which will show you 3.7 miles. And just like Sean said, click on the video. Same information is in that video to, to get you what you need. But great, great question, Noah. Thanks for asking. Shall you said a couple course questions or did that cover most of it? Yes, a couple more. Um, Will from Caldwell County asked what the elevation change looks like on this course. Again, per the uh, website link to the race course GPX file, it's showing 270 feet of elevation and 270 feet of descent. And Cooper from Cabarrus County asked if there will be tape along the section of chunky or downhill so that folks will not be walking across it as riders are coming through. So as we go out and set the infield and our course setters go out, um, we will evaluate places to put up tape to protect our students while racing. So that may be a weekend decision as we look at the course. Thank you. And Claudia Baum asked if there will be points along the course that can be viewed from the pit zone. Uh, the pit zone is not adjacent to the woods. So from pit zone, you'll be able to see all the finishers racing up the hill. Um, if you want to go see in the woods, there will be a course crossing on the start up near the top of the hill. Um, to make sure you can see the student athletes coming. Um, or you can go around the bottom edge of staging adventure and the start shoot and go in and look in the woods from there. To the spectator zone in yellow. Thanks, Ben. And I think that's all we've got for questions, except one that you are about to answer very soon. <laughs> you know where I'm going next. Hey, I think those were all student athlete questions. I recognize some of those names. So thanks. They thanks were. For those, thanks for getting those on the table. And Cooper, I, I suspect that's an experience based question that you asked <laughs> there. So thanks. Thanks for getting that on the table. Uh, yeah, I was going to go uh, next to to Sunday and I'll start uh, pretty much at the beginning of the day. Uh, like uh, we're used to, 8 o'clock coaches meeting with Sean, opening ceremony at 8.40. Uh, I think we've got uh, Lena from Stanley Shredder singing the national anthem this weekend. That's awesome. Uh, but new for Salisbury and something new we did at Browns Creek is implementing a warm-up course uh, for our student-athletes. And when I go to the map, we're going to do the same thing at Salisbury. And that warm-up loop is the Greenbrier Trail over in this area. So we've got folks out working on it the day before. And to answer that question that may come up, no, we're not going to be riding on that trail during Saturday. We're going to let the trail workers uh, have that all to themselves. But on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, uh, we will open that trail for warm-up, maybe even cool down. Uh, and Sean Moore, I think after a lot of staff discussion about how it went last uh, weekend, uh, they do not need to be coach led student athletes can go out there in pairs much like they do uh, green lap on Saturday and do a warm up loop. Correct. Just a small clarification, though, you said Saturday at eight o'clock, it's Sunday at eight o'clock that, that Sun will open up. It will be closed on Saturday for trail work. That is correct. Closed on on Saturday, let the trail workers do their their thing. And then Sunday morning, at eight o'clock, mainly for that middle school wave one, they can get out there and, and get the heartbeat up. Uh, so and there will there will be a roving course marshal uh, in that area or that trail. So it, it won't be totally on your own, um, living by your wits. If something happens, um, trying to survive, there will be someone along who can help. Correct. And much like Ben said, some game day decisions, we're going to take a look at how to get in and out of that trail while we're out there, uh, try to avoid the lollipop on it. I just wanted to point to everyone here. In order to get from pit zone to that trail, you have to go through that course crossing. 
And so after wave one, which is only one lap, all those one lappers come into the woods here and they come off the course right here. That course crossing isn't impacted too much. Once we go to wave two, we will have riders coming across that course crossing. So coaches, student athletes, look at the race schedule, find the time you need to get across the crossing, get your warm up in and then back in. So you make staging on time. It's a little bit complicated, but we thought it was right to keep that warm up loop open uh, on Sunday to give you that uh, that option. Uh, you certainly got respect that. the volunteers that are running that course crossing. Yeah, absolutely. That, we're, we're telling them to keep keep racers safe. So yeah, listen to your your course uh, crossing guards. Go ahead, John. I think you were about to say something. That that warm up loop is one way, and it's counterclockwise. So it will be to the right. Thank you for that. Yeah. And then um, let's go back to the schedule and just talk about uh, Sunday. A um, little bit different from Browns Creek simply because we've got more riders coming. We actually added a field to high school boys three. Great to see a lot of high school three boys coming out. Uh, and we're keeping maybe not as much time in between categories and fields as we have Browns Creek because we do have good race data on some riders now. But we've got a little extra space in between categories and fields to make sure we reduce passing opportunities as much as we can uh, out in the woods. So it's looking like just in terms of uh, total length, a Browns Creek type of day. I'll anticipate five o'clock for podiums uh, to get us through the day. And while we're on uh, podiums, uh, caught me by surprise a little bit at Browns Creek, the amount of other things that were coming up to podiums, bikes and stuffed animals and all that. We, we won't do that anymore. We're, we're there to celebrate the humans that are coming up the podium. So let's just keep it the, the riders coming up the podiums. And then we'll keep those podiums up there. After we're done with the ceremony, hey, bring your stuff up. Take the team photo. Take photo with whatever you want. Uh, but we won't do that in the podiums. And that's to keep the podiums running on time uh, as well. And then uh, final uh, comments for me just to, about weather. Uh, always host the weather call on Thursday. So tomorrow, uh, just after 11 o'clock, league staff, meteorologist, the venue owner, and trail boss all getting together and uh, looking at, at the upcoming weather. And right now, it looks like some rain late Friday and some pretty high winds, uh, which will probably impact the staff a little bit in getting set up. So you may notice us Saturday morning uh, scrambling. Up pun pun intended. Uh, to get set up before uh, 10 o'clock and all the activities. Okay. On Sunday. Saturday looks like a pretty nice day. And then uh, Sunday, another chance of rain. Uh, the good news is Trail Boss says that trail is holding up uh, really well. Leonard's been out there a couple times. Trail's holding up pretty well. So I think we have the potential to get wet this weekend, but I don't see a race cancellation, potentially a delay on Sunday based on what that weather does. Uh, everyone just pay attention to Team Snap and the Communication League puts out about any schedule changes at noon tomorrow. I'll tell everyone where to go or, hey, we've got to change something uh, for the weekend. But it looks like everything's supportable uh, for the weekend. Uh, so let's pause there again. Uh, Shell, are there any kind of Sunday questions in the chat? And then we'll just open it up for general questions about anything. We have a few questions about how long the Greenbrier Trail is. Uh, I think we discussed last night about a mile to get around, but Leonard, people that are closer to Salisbury know it. Brian, it's 4,900 feet, so not quite a mile. Not quite a mile. Okay, thank you. Great question. And Cooper was wondering if there's a policy about balloons being near the course like there is about dogs. So I can uh, say with confidence that there is no written policy about balloons being near the course like there is for pets on here. But it sounds like there's a, some concern behind that. Uh, Cooper, do you want to specify what you're looking for? You think balloons should not be near the course? And if he wants to add on to that question, I would say for any item object near a course, we want to maintain some distance from racers and riders um, to make sure they're not interfered with. I think that might be the basis of Cooper's question. Maybe a balloon floating in front of a rider coming up that uh, long hill towards the finish, uh, not going to be you know, great for that athlete. So I'd just use this as an opportunity to remind everyone to be respectful of all the riders on the course and not be pushing stuff out over the course tape, uh, whatever it is, uh, to get in the way of the rider. Is that fair enough, Cooper? Cooper said they were just wondering. It was just general question because he's wanting to do something with the balloons for the weekend theme. 
Well, I'm I'm with you on balloons because it does seem to be part of this weekend theme for right, Shell. Uh, yep, you need enough balloons to make a balloon afro like Brian. There you go. Just like Brian was saying, be aware of, of how they're blowing in the wind as far as the race course interference. Should be good. Okay, anything else in the chat, Shell, you can see, or do we just open up the, the floor at this point? I think we covered them all. If I missed any, speak now. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we missed anything, sure that we're here to get questions answered. So get get those on the table. Let's uh, open the floor, so to speak. What uh, what you all have for Salisbury scramble? Other than no, that's not my real hair. That's the balloon afro Shell was talking about behind me. Well, that might have been a very thorough brief, but um... somebody asked a good one that it might be helpful for others to know the answer to. They asked if they should bring tools to help with the trail work. I said that'd be fantastic if you have them and you want to bring them, um, but we will have some tools on hand as well. So. Brian, I've got one thing to add. Over to Sean, please add. So uh, head coaches, team directors, and coaches in general, uh, we've kind of done a little bit of a look at our pit zone, uh, and some of your licenses are showing as not uh, fully compliant. So I want you all to sort of be proactive and take a look and see whether or not your license has expired. Could be some simple little training that is off that you need to complete. But if you're kind of going to be an integral part of your team this weekend, you need to be compliant with that in order to participate in team practices. So uh, make sure you get that taken care of. And I'll be reaching out to head coaches and team directors tomorrow. There's about 45 coaches that currently show as being at what's called level zero. So just see if you are you have anything that's expired that's holding up your license and get that taken care of based up. So. Someone asked if there's a mechanic or technical assistance area on site. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Skinny Wheels, who is a local bike shop and actually the owner is a former uh, NICA coach of ours, uh, Eric, uh, will be out there uh, both Saturday, uh, like the programs and adventure folks talk that helps with those skills clinics uh, on Saturday. And then certainly Sunday, they are there to provide uh, neutral support for the race. So great question. Yep. Skinny Wheels will be there both days. And then just in terms of other things, while folks might be thinking about some questions, uh, some awesome food trucks uh, for the weekend, merchandise, TC screen printing, uh, we'll be back. Uh, we have Trek returning uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, folks might remember uh, their hospitality zone from last season. We'll have them set up on Sunday, some fun and games uh, while the races are going on. We've got uh, Marianne from Greensboro Trek coming down. I think Nolan uh, is coming with her. So we'll have some extra things on Sunday as well for folks to check out. Someone asked if the warm-up course is open to younger siblings. The warm-up course is open to registered student-athletes wearing their wristband. Not So if the younger sibling is a registered athlete with a wristband, yes. If not, then no. And Michael Hightfield asked if MSA student athletes are allowed help on the race without a penalty like other middle schoolers, or do they receive a penalty like high schoolers since they are in an advanced category? So the delineation with that is how many laps student athletes race. So MSAs are multi-lap racers, so they would incur a penalty. All single lap racers, including high school three, which is a single clap high school race, they can all accept outside assistance without penalty. 
but any multi-lap race racer would incur a penalty for outside assistance. Thanks for clarifying that, Sean. iPhone 129 asks, will there be space enough for a pop-up tent? iPhone 129, could you explain what pop-up tent and where are you needing a tent? While we wait for iPhone 129 to identify themselves, I see another question. What about the Adventure Zone? Can younger siblings ride their bikes in Adventure Zone? The program's area is for registered student athletes, but the Trek Zone, um, younger student or younger siblings can participate in. So iPhone 129 is their first race. So welcome to the first race of the season for you. Uh, your team will have a designated location. Uh, if you go to our league website, go up to the very top of what's happening to the event schedule. Um, within the event flyer link, you will find a course map. Where did it go? Pit zone map is under the venue guidance. I think it's where it's linked, correct? All the way down to page four, uh, you'll find the pit zone map and your team uh, that you're associated with will have a designated location within pit zone for you to gather for the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, the team should have team tents of some sort um, and they should all fit within the allocated spaces that we have at Salisbury. Uh, please be aware that Salisbury's infield is not the most level of any of the infields we've ever gone to. Um, they do have some we call water bars and rolling hills. So your pit zone, as much as we like to have flat level spots, might not be this weekend. So <clears throat> pit zone will be set up Friday for teams to arrive on Saturday. Um, that link that we just showed you will have the pit zone map so you can find your team and locate where you need to go. Ben, I shared my screen again, showed everyone the venue map, the link to your pit zone map, and thank you for putting that together is also embedded in the pit zone on the map. So, uh, Play with where he can find the food trucks listed. I can't hear you. Can you come tell me? And hopefully we're not about to hear someone be yelled at. Yeah, really yell anymore. Yeah, the, the, this this could get interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, food trucks for for this uh, season. Uh, I'd refer everyone that, to uh, the single track times for this event that we release. Um, the Thursday before registration, so last Thursday, oh, we included the food trucks in there, and we've got this little piggies and bearded barbecue uh, coming, or at least scheduled to come. Uh, I'll caveat that <laughs> food trucks are, are a unique uh, entity, and uh, that's who we have scheduled uh, for this weekend. Someone is wondering for tent camping, do we just find our own space when we arrive? Yeah, I mean, the tent camping is primarily on the athletic field or to the left by the bathhouses. So when you're when you're when you come in to unload, you can just pick a spot. There's, there should be plenty of room. And, and while we're on there, uh, Michael, let's give a shout out to Brian from Lincoln County, who's our camp mayor uh, for the weekend, just helping folks get organized, maybe find their their way around the campsite. So it's great. Uh, our home team stepping up, uh, doing some camp mayor, helping Michael out with uh, the camping organization. That's fantastic. Sean, can you clarify for the warm up route on Sunday? student athletes still would need to display a race plate 
along with their wristband, correct? 100% race plates should be on bikes at all times once they enter the race venue. They should never be taken off. Hey, Sean, while we're, while we're on that, do we need to talk about a uh, race plate, uh, how Position. to positioning a fix them? A hundred percent. So uh, there was an issue with uh, timing at Browns Creek because a lot of the race plates were actually horizontal. So they were invisible to the hand jammers that were um, hand doing timing. And we did have a race that came down to uh, the rider's plate didn't get picked up. And so the hand jammers had to be uh, taking down the numbers. That's in impossible if the number is not visible. So that number needs to be vertical so that it can be seen and it needs to be affixed at top and bottom. And it should be in front of the cables. Uh, that way they're not obscured in any way. So uh, if you you know need assistance with that, I can kind of swing through the pits on Saturday and help out with that but that's going to be the the need that you have in order to ensure that there's correct scoring of the event and with that said we we try to look at them all when they're lined up in the start shoot um but time is not our friend if they're lined up in the in the start shoot they're they're ready to they have to be ready to go And, you know, so make sure that you're ready to go when you get called up, because if you get into the chute and anything is wrong, you're going to have to exit the chute. And then you will start in the back of your field, not the back of your uh, your group. Uh, so if we think about the wave is divided into different fields. So if you are, let's say, in HS2 and there are two separate fields, if you are in the first field and you're not ready and you have to exit, you won't go in the back of field one. You'll go in the back of field two. The call-ups will continue. You won't be slotted in. You can't duck under the tape to get to where you think you should be. You have to go in at the back. So there's a, a big incentive for you to be ready to go whenever you get called up. Uh, I had a clarification to one of the questions about van camping. Um, van camping, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, they should still register as a part of a camper and park in the normal camping spaces, not in a vehicle's camping spot, correct? Well, I mean, they need to register, but the way we've done it in the past is that um, as long as the camper van will fit in a normal parking space, meaning that if you, you know, you drive it and you park it like a vehicle, then typically that's what's allowed. Um, Salisbury does ask that we group the campers together in the evening so that we don't have campers spread throughout the yeah. entire course. So yes, in the evening, perhaps shuffle yourself down towards where the travel trailers and RVs are. But um, otherwise, you know, besides registering, um, just th there is no specific parking spot for a van camper. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and Michael, we can let everyone know, too, that we'll have Vivian uh, with us this weekend. Vivian is actually a Salisbury Parks and Rec member who comes out to camp with us. And uh, I hope everyone understood what I just said there. <laughs> comes out to camp with us uh, at her park. Uh, so great, great support from Salisbury. Love having Vivian out there. So, yeah, Viv Vivian will be uh, spending the weekend with us, everybody. We had a question about, and Michael answered this in the chat, but I think it might be helpful for everyone um, about whether solo stoves are allowed or not. And then follow up to that, are propane stoves allowed? Well, again, these um, a lot of the tent camping and stuff is done on athletic fields. These are baseball fields, nicely manicured. So you know, the reason we're invited back to all these venues is because we take such good care of them. And um, so, yeah, I, I would not have a propane stove or anything like that on any of the grass areas. Um, I think you'd probably be okay on the, um, on the asphalt, I guess. But again, it's, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if you're talking about a very small propane stove or a gas grill or something huge. I mean, there's, there's differences. So, yeah, I'm not sure, WJ, what you've got. And Rodney wants to know if there's coffee. 
not for student athletes. Not not planned with any of our food vendors that I'm aware of, unless they're they're going to sneak some in that we don't know about. Okay, we've got uh, a couple minutes left before we come to the top of the hour. We'll maybe take one or two more before we call it a call it a town hall. And uh, this will be uh, posted on our uh, league YouTube channel uh, by the morning. Sean, thanks for putting that out there like you always do. Uh, so coaches, uh, anyone else, someone didn't catch the town hall, they can look at it uh, tomorrow before they come out for uh, the weekend. And you had one other chat come in about the uh... – Overflow or satellite parking. Um, again, that's on our race map, Google map. Um, you'll see that outside of the Salisbury Community Park, just a few feet down the road at the local elementary school. Um, that is a self shuttle overflow. So if you end up needing that elementary school overflow parking, I would highly recommend a helmet and a bicycle to come back to the venue. Yeah, th thanks for that, Ben. The overflow is Hurley uh, Elementary School. The one or two other areas that I mentioned are uh, essentially game day decisions that uh, maybe Sam or Ben, uh, some extra areas around the asphalt parking, a little bit of grass, and we'll, we'll have to be careful with the park where we can put uh, some extra cars. But we did that the last time we were at Salisbury. We put some folks up on the grass uh, for some overflow. That's what I meant by the one or two other areas. Just uh, listen to Sam. He'll, he'll guide you and everyone in the right way. Okay. Well, I've got about a minute before nine o'clock. So let me uh, just close by thanking everyone for dialing in uh, tonight. Hope we got most of the questions answered. I think we did. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone. Uh, again, for what looks to be another great weekend, uh, make sure everyone travels safe. If you've got any other questions about uh, some that came up tonight, info at NorthCarolinaMTB.org, and uh, we'll do our best we can to answer that before we head out uh, ourselves. Uh, I think most of you are aware most of the staff starts traveling tomorrow uh, out to the venue and will be on site Friday, so limited email uh, communications come Thursday night and even uh, into Friday. But uh, hey, everyone, thanks for what you do. Student athletes, awesome questions tonight. Uh, that was super cool. Uh, great to hear from you all. And uh, everyone travel safe. We'll see you out at uh, Salisbury Scramble.